Okay, could somebody confirm you can hear me? Yes. Thank you. Let me share my screen. My computer is going to be a little slow because I'm still making the meeting from the, um, the lecture. And that'll happen for a few minutes. Let's see how far we are. 93% down. All right. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So we're going to cover lab nine. Don't forget, you got a quiz this Wednesday. Well, lab nine is the identification of gram negative organisms. You should also be working on your unknown work. And I have not checked to see if anyone's put anything up in the unknown notes. My apologies. I meant to do that earlier today. Um, I did check on Sunday, and I sent out results to some people on Sunday. Some people asked for the MR test, which that requires five days incubation. So you guys had to wait, at least as of Sunday. I might be able to send that now. I'll have to take a look. Uh, any questions about what we're going to do? So we'll work on Lab 9, but don't forget, you should be working on your unknown project as well. Oh, good. The uh, lecture file just finished. So let me save that down. And let's go to the uh, lab nine. Nope, still in lecture. Get it in time. Oh, there is it. There it is. So lab nine, the ID of gram negative bacilli. This is the last lab for the course. <clears throat> You're gonna be working on this lab. You're gonna complete some case studies and obviously completing the lab nine worksheet. There is some reading to do, not too bad, a little bit of chapter five, actually only one page in chapter five, and then a little bit on uh, chapter 10, the method methods for classifying and identifying microorganisms, that's page 272 to page 276. You're gonna be looking at some video clips in today's lab, and then these are your learning objectives. <clears throat> One, be able to interpret the results for the following biochemical tests. You need to understand the IMVIC reactions. And IMVIC is an acronym for four different tests. The Indole test, the methyl red test, the vogues Proscure test, and the Citrate test. And let me warn you, I'm not Russian, so I could be really butchering this name. We're also gonna talk about carbohydrate fermentation test and the motility test and the hydrogen sulfide production test. Any question about these different tests? In addition, you need to be able to explain and interpret the TSI. This is the triple sugar iron slant, which is really several tests put into one. And uh, I think we have three different tests running on that one. The SIMS test is uh, an acronym for sulfide, indole, and motility test. So once again, we're running three tests at once. And then explaining the growth on McConkie's and hectone enteric auger plates, uh, often abbreviated MAC plates and HE plates. Um. For these, you're really looking at two different things. They're both uh, selective plates, so only certain species can grow on them. In both cases, it's the gram negatives, which can grow on MAC and HE plates. And then they're looking at the uh, differentiation. You should be able to differentiate the cell types or the different 
cells on whether they can ferment the sugar lactose. Now, is that right for HE? HE may do one other thing. I don't remember if that has, um, if that looks at uh, hydrogen sulfide production or not. I don't remember that. I'm not really good at the HE test, but uh, it might look at a, uh, hydrogen sulfide production also. Anyways, and then three, use biochemical analysis to solve case studies involving gram-negative bacterial infections. Now, to do the case studies, I think this time, I think I've got it mm, all in one link. Let me go to the lab page there. I make sure that's turned on. It is good. Why isn't that highlighted? Oh, because somebody submitted something. All right, that's not a problem. Um, yeah, I've got all of the uh, case studies. I think it's in the worksheet, which I already got open here. Nope, it's not there. So it must be in the lab module. So everything is in the lab module. Do not turn in the lab module, only turn in the uh, worksheet. But we have the case studies. I've got it linked to the lab module. And that's because I designed this uh, lab, so I stuck everything together. All right. Um, so members of the family Enteriobacteriaceae are one of the, the uh, species we're going to talk about today. And we're talking about gram-negative bacilli. And obviously, the interior bacteria are small gram-negative bacilli. They're all non-spore forming. They are facultative anaerobes. And they all ferment the sugar glucose. And they're all oxidase negative as well. And so these are some characteristics for this family. There are 53 genera and, uh, in this family. So it's a very large family. And there are 24 genera that are known to cause human infections. Below are 12 common genera that cause uh, humans infections. Like Salmonella and Shigella, I'm sure you've all heard of. Most of these genera are normal microbiota of the intestinal tract, aka we call them coliforms because they live in the colon. They are opportunistic pathogens in that they can cause infections when they're grown in other places, like urinary tract and wound infections, pneumonia, septicemia. So E. coli is found in our intestines, but if it's found elsewhere, it will cause an infection, an opportunistic infection, like in the lungs, it'll cause pneumonia, uh, uh, urinary tract infection, if it's found in the urethra or the bladder or both. There are some common genera responsible for causing opportunistic infections, including Escherichia, especially E. coli, Enterobacter, Klebsiella, Citrobacter, and Serratia. So these are opportunistic 
in that they can cause opportunistic infections. But there are several genera which cause gastroenteritis, and these include the genera Salmonella, Shigella, and then certain variants of E. coli or Escherichia coli, such as Cirovar 0157H7. You do not want this E. coli, this strain, because it will give you uh, gastroenteritis, meaning diarrhea and upset stomach. And it's just because of the different antigens. This is a human pathogen because of the different antigens on this E. coli. Now, there is another member of the, a member, another family of bacteria we need to talk about. They also are short gram negative bacilli. And these are the Pseudomonaceae family, especially Pseudomonas aeruginosa in that this is a human pathogen. And the pseudomonas are small gram-negative bacilli. However, they all cannot ferment the sugar glucose and they're all oxidase positive. So this is two ways you can distinguish um, the pseudomonas from uh, the Enterobacteriaceae. Any question about any of that? So Pseudomono, Pseudomonas aeruginosa is considered an opportunistic pathogen. It particularly can cause infections in immunosuppressed individuals, burn patients, and trauma patients. Fortunately, Pseudomonas aeruginosa rarely infects a healthy individual because Pseudomonas aeruginosa has a hard time getting established on a healthy patient and it just does not do well getting through intact skin in the intact mucous membranes. However, in a trauma patient, a burn patient, or immunosuppressed individual, Pseudomonas aeruginosa can get through. Obviously, a burn patient, their skin is gone in the burn, and the trauma patient, depending on what the trauma is, they can either have a, a defects in their skin or their mucous membranes and Pseudomonas aeruginosa can get established. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is also implicated in, in nosocomial infections, also called hospital or healthcare acquired infections. And you can find Pseudomonas aeruginosa in anything that's essentially moist, like hospital drains, sinks, and water, like flower vases, even dilute soap solutions. It's an important for a microbiologist to be able to identify and perform antibiotic susceptibility testing on gram-negative bacilli. When a clinic receives a specimen from a patient, they have to run different tests to identify the species causing the infection. And we're going to look at some common bi biochemical tests used to identify the gram-negative bacilli. And this is showing you some of them, but we're not going to talk about all of these. We're going to talk about the indole test. Some organisms can produce the enzyme tryptophanase, which converts the amino acid tryptophan into indole and pyruvic acid. What you do is you incubate overnight or over two nights, add COVAX reagent, and COVAX reagent in the presence of indole produces a red color at the surface. E. coli, is positive for indole and will be red. And other species are negative. And that doesn't look very red, but that's supposed to be indole positive and that's indole negative. Uh, tryptophan is converted into indole, which in the presence of COVAC reagent is supposed to turn red. And this photograph, I think, is a little bit uh, colored. 
Uh, two other tests we're going to talk about are the methyl red test and the Vogue's Proscure test. These two tests are usually started together in one tube. You then incubate the tube and then split the tube into two tubes. One tube, you run the methyl red test. And in the other tube, you run the VP or Vogue's Proscure test. Okay. So usually these tests are started together and then you split it to do the methyl red test and the Vogue's Proscure test. Both tests are looking at what products are made from the result of glycolysis. If acid products are made, you run the uh, MR test to determine that acid products are made. And if neutral products are, are made, you run the VP test. Uh, both tests will be read if the test is positive. So MR test will be read and the VP test will be read if it's positive. What you do is you inoculate an MRVP broth, meaning you start with one tube, and uh, you inoculate it for two to five days at 35 degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. Methyl red, or you then split the tube into two, methyl red is added to one tube. And if the tube remains red in color, it's because there are acids and the methyl red will remain red. And then that's positive for the methyl red test. If acids are not produced, the methyl red, once you add it, will immediately turn yellow. And that will be a methyl red negative. And there's a methyl red positive tube, and there's a methyl red negative tube. All right, the other half of the tube, or the second tube, you uh, use for the VP test. And you have to add Barrett's A and Barrett's B solutions to the, the tube. And then uh, you shake it to get oxygen in. And if red color develops at the interface within 60 minutes, so this tube runs for 60 minutes, uh, then acetone, a neutral product, is produced. And that would be VP positive. Note how not all the tube is positive, only the the uh, interface is with the air um, is red. And that's VP positive. If the tube remains yellow, it's VP negative. And this shows the production of acetone, a neutral product from glycolysis. All right. Uh, the last of the IMVIC tests is the citrate utilization test. In this test, we have a tube where the only carbon and energy source is the sugar citrate. If the organism can grow and metabolize the citrate, you will see growth on the tube and it will turn blue. Uh, the growth actually becomes alkaline that changes the pH to being blue. And uh, that is citrate positive. If on the other hand, the microbes cannot metabolize citrate, there will be no carbon source or energy source for the uh, bacteria to grow. So they won't grow and the tube will remain green in color. So that's citrate negative. All right, just to remind you, citrate is a sugar in the Krebs cycle. And if the bacteria can me metabolize it, it'll use citrate in the Krebs cycle to metabolize it. All right. Uh, another test we want to talk about is the carbohydrate metabolism test. And this is a tube that has one sugar in it. 
And if the bacteria can ferment that sugar, it will change, well, make acid products in, in fermenting the sugar. And that'll change the color of the tomb from red or pinkish to yellow. And that would be uh, carbohydrate fermentation positive. Usually we call this by the sugar name. So if you have the sugar sucrose in there, you say that this is sucrase positive or positive for sucrose fermentation. Okay. Uh, you only have one sugar in each tube, but you can vary that sugar. Uh, I'm allowing you to do glucose, sucrose, lactose, mannose, and inulin. All of those sugars can be uh, fermented on your unknown product. But there's any sugar can be put in there. And whatever it is, you call it, usually like if you put fru fructose in there, you call it the fructose fermentation test. The tube has an inverted Durham tube in it filled with media. And if the bacteria can ferment the sugar, it will be positive, but we don't call it positive. We call it A for acid. And if it ferments the sugar, as well as produces gas in the fermentation of the sugar, there will be bubbles that'll be trapped by the inverted Durham tube. And so this is positive for gas production. This we call AG for acid and gas production. And so you can have three results for carbohydrate fermentation. Usually you call that like glucose fermentation. You can have negative, and the tube will look like this. You can have it acid, the tube will look like that. And then you can have acid and gas. And there's the tube like that with the bubble. Any questions about the carbohydrate fermentation? Yes. All right. We also need to talk about the motility medium. This is a semi-fluid, semi-solid, agar that has very low concentration of agar in the tube. And so the bacteria, if they can swim, can actually swim through this semi-solid media, meaning it is solid, but it's it's got the consistency somewhat of jello, meaning it's not really firm. And it's lower concentration of agar than you would normally find in a auger tube. You stab inoculate the bacteria in the tube, pulling out the stab in the same way you stuck it in. So it has a single straight indentation of the needle. And you only stab with a needle because if you use the, the loop, you would ruin the loop or soon ruin the loop. So you'll need stab with the needle. And if the growth remains only in the stab, this is motile negative. If on the other hand, the growth grows away from the stab, as shown here, then it is motile positive. And that's why the tube is cloudy everywhere. Let me go back to that picture. Uh, that's why the tube is cloudy everywhere. The bacteria uh, swam away from the stab mark. And you notice how this tube is clear there. It's cloudy there. It's cloudy there because there's growth everywhere in the tube. And that's because the bacteria are swimming and they're highly motile. Now, if the bacteria are not highly motile, the bacteria will not swim everywhere. Where's my mouse? So let me draw a tube. And then we stab and the bacteria will grow in the stab, but it won't grow everywhere. What it'll do is it'll flare out of the stab mark. And so you'll see something like this, trying to make a 
circular. My mouse isn't working too well. And occasionally it'll be the same or similar, but usually it'll be flaring out a little different on the other side. And so if you see something like that, this will be um, also motile. This is slightly motile, a bacteria that can swim a little bit because it has a flagella or a flagellum. Uh, and this is highly motile. The bacteria swam everywhere in the tube. Any question about that? Both of them would be motile positive. This is motile negative, where there's only growth in the stab. You can do the motile test in motility media, which only looks at the motility of the bacteria. You can also do the motility by inoculating a SIMS tube where you stab inoculate uh, the sulfur indole motility test. And uh, this test will look at more than one thing, such as, oh, let's see, right here. And if the bacteria, let me blow that up a little. If the bacteria grow only in the stab mark shown here, then it's not motile. And if the bacteria go everywhere, that's why it's black everywhere, then it's motile. And you see right here, how uh, this has this growth in the stab, but right there, it's flaring out. Right there and right there. And that's a real big flare in right there. And this one is probably in aerobe, so it's mostly growing near the top. Or uh, maybe a facultative anaerobe, and it's growing mostly at the top. Uh, anyways, the point is, this is motile. And this is a SIMS tube, which you can look at motility in the SIMS tube. A uh, SIM, if you remember, stands for sulfide indole motility. The Motility is what we're looking at. Uh, hydrogen sulfide production is another test I want to talk about. You can test for the production of hydrogen sulfide in different media, such as triple sugar iron, uh, the SIMS test, sulfide indole motility test. And you can test for it in the HE plates. In all cases, if the organism produces hydrogen sulfide, it'll turn the test black, regardless of whether it's the triple sugar iron, triple iron sugar, no, triple sugar iron, that's not right, triple sugar iron, or sulfide indole motility, or the HE plates. It'll always be black if it's producing hydrogen sulfide. And there's certain species that do that. Here we go. This looks like a SIMS tube. And uh, it's black from the production of uh, hydrogen sulfide. Let's take a look at hydrogen sulfide in the uh, triple sugar iron TSI tube. So that's black. So that's hydrogen sulfide production. And then let's look at HE plate. You note on this part of the HE plate, it's not black, and these colonies are black. They're black because these colonies are producing hydrogen sulfide. Any question about any of that? All right. So let's talk briefly about the triple sugar iron test. It's an auger slant. And when you inoculate the auger slant, you take your needle and you roll it or put the tip in the bacteria, and then you stab inoculate the tube. You then pull the needle out and then inoculate the tip once again with bacteria, and then you streak the slant with bacteria. 
So the idea is we're going to be growing the bacteria anaerobically in the stab as well as aerobically on the slant. Triple sugar iron tubes have three different sugars in them, glucose, lactose, and sucrose, but the glucose is at a different concentration in one-tenth of the amount of sugar as the lactose and the sucrose. It also has a pH indicator in it to determine whether the sugar is fermented. If the sugar is fermented, the tube will turn yellow as acid products are made. It does have a peptone for a source of nitrogen for metabolism, and it does have sodium thiosulfate in it and ferrous sulfate and that's to, to protect the production of hydrogen sulfide. And if hydrogen sulfide is made, I've already made it, the statement that the tube will turn black, at least in the bud. You can also test for the production of gas in the fermentation of sugar. And with gas, you'll either get lifting of the media or a bubble in it. You can also get breaking of the auger from the production of gas. If the sugar is fermented, it'll turn yellow. So obviously this is, the sugar is fermented. Now, on this case, we don't know which sugar is fermented, except that it is at least glucose and at least one of the other sugars, either sucrose or lactose. We don't know which, but at least one of the sugars is fermented. So this one has no production of hydrogen sulfide because it's not black. Gas is produced. And then glucose is fermented because that's the base sugar. And at least one of the other sugars are fermented, lactose, or sucrose, but both of the, the lactose and sucrose may be fermented. The test doesn't tell you that. On tube three, we do not have gas being produced. There's no bubble. There's no breaking of the auger. There's no hydrogen sulfide being produced because it's not black. And then glucose is fermented and glucose is the only sugar that is fermented. How we know glucose is fermented is because the butt is yellow, but the slant is red or pinkish. What happened if you looked at this tube earlier, the slant would have been yellow and the butt would have been yellow. But what happened is all of the sugar was fermented in the slant and fermentation happens quicker in the slant because of aerobic respiration, this is growing aerobically, this is growing anaerobically. So all of the sugar was fermented and rather than die, the bacteria switch from utilizing sugar to utilizing the protein in the media. Once the protein is digested, uh, the bacteria will make ammonia, which is basic. And that will convert the yellow color of the slant to reddish or pink from the basic production of ammonia, from the utilization of protein. So the slant will be red if glucose is fermented and only glucose is fermented, but the, the butt, which is metabolized slower, will be yellow. Any question about any of that? All right, in tube two, we see that the slant is red, so we know only the sugar glucose is fermented. And you can't see it because it's black on the bottom, but if it's black, you can assume that the sugar was fermented because whenever it's black, you always have the sugar being fermented. You can just take it as a rule of thumb, I guess. So this would be yellow if you could see it. You just can't see it. So glucose is fermented. There is no gas being produced because there's no breaking of the auger. There's no bubble. And then it's black, so hydrogen sulfide is being produced. 
Any question about any of that? All right. Tube one is unchanged. No breaking of the auger. No bubble, so there's no gas production. It's not black, so no hydrogen sulfide is being produced. It's not yellow, so there's no sugar being produced, uh, fermented. So this one would be negative. Any question about any of that? The interpretation of the TSI slant is a little difficult. I'll warn you of that. All right. The SIM uh, tube is uh, three tests in one. It's looking at the production of sulfide, hydrogen sulfide, and it's looking at the production of endol and the production of motility. And so sulfide, endol, motility, take each initial, and that's where we get the SIMS test. You stab, inoculate the tube with the bacteria, as shown here. You then incubate it. And uh, uh, you add COVAX reagent to the top of the tube. If the COVAX reagent does not change color, it's um, no indole is produced. And if it turns pinkish at the interface at the top, then uh, indole was produced. So in tube one, tube two, tube three, and tube four, uh, indole was produced, and the control as well as tube 5, indole was not produced. You then look to see where the bacteria are growing. If the bacteria are only in the stab, tube 2, tube 3, this one's hard to read, and tube 5, the bacteria is not motile. In tube 4 and tube 1, uh, tube one, we know it uh, is everywhere because the black's everywhere. Tube four, you can see it's flared at the top. So this one is motile. These two are motile. And uh, the third test is if the tube turns black, you have hydrogen sulfide being produced. So tube one uh, has hydrogen sulfide being produced, tube two, three, four, five, and the control do not. All right, any question about the uh, SIMS test? I've kind of already talked about uh, McConkie's and HE plates. We've talked about these before. Both of them are selective, and only gram negatives tend to grow on McConkie's and HE. So if you have growth or gram negative, if there is no growth, it's a gram positive. Both of them ferment the sugar lactose. And if they do not ferment the sugar lactose, the bacteria will be its normal color, in this case, off-white or white, in this case, white. Okay. In McConkie's, if the, or macaque, sorry, mac, McConkie's Mac, uh, if the bacteria can ferment the sugar lactose, the bacteria will turn pink, as well as the media around the bacteria will turn pink. If the bacteria on an HE plate can ferment the sugar lactose, the bacteria will turn salmon color, a yellow-orange salmon color. If the bacteria cannot ferment the sugar lactose, they will not be salmon color, and they will be their normal color. In this case, it would be white. HE plates can also distinguish the production of hydrogen sulfide, and I've already mentioned that. And if hydrogen sulfide is produced, they will be black. The cells colonies will be black. All right. So in lab nine, you're not going to be physically performing any of these biochemical tests, but you are responsible for knowing how to perform and interpret them. We have video clips for the carbohydrate fermentation test. So watch that. We have a video clip on the SEMS test. We have a video clip on the MR and the VP test. Remember, this is two tests 
which are usually started together in one tube. And then we split that into two tubes and we run the MR test in one tube and the VP test on the other tube. And then we have a video on the triple sugar iron or the TSI test and a video on the McConkie's auger test. So watch these videos. You should also view some of the information on the website Microbuzz. Let me go there now. Go to Microbuzz and you only need to click on one of the links here. Where do I have that? The differential test to the left and you only need to click on the test that you need to get information to finish the worksheet in lab nine, which isn't shown here. So let me go to the worksheet. So here's the worksheet. So you need to look on the test uh, in Microbus uh, for the tests that are not described in the lab module. And if you want, you can look at the tests that are on this table that are in the lab module. I mean, you can use Microbuzz instead of the lab module if you wish. But the point is, you must use Microbuzz for getting some of this information to fill in the table. The first test for the positive result has been filled in for you. For the oxidase test, if the bacteria are oxidase positive, the cell or the spot where you have the bacteria and the reagents will turn blue. And the negative, you can fill in the information that doesn't turn blue. Okay, so the first has been filled in. Make sure you answer it similar to what's filled in here. I had some student put in an X. And an X doesn't mean anything in the last uh, uh, table. Nope, wrong one. So uh, let's go back to Microbuzz and uh, we can look up the indole test and the MR test, for example. So hit on the differential test link over here and you see how that runs up. And we have a number of tests. You don't need to look at all of them, but Well, Indol isn't on here because it's in the lab module. Oh, there's the methyl red and the Vogue's Briscure test. So that tells you about the information about the methyl red test. All right, any questions about how to work this? Come on. So fill in the table, fill in the worksheet to lab nine, and then do the case studies. Case studies, the information is below. Where you record the information is in the worksheet. So you need to fill in the answers to part two of the worksheet, uh, like uh, A, 2A. What reagent must be added to detect the presence of indole? So put in that agent there. Scroll down to the case studies. You can use this table to identify the bacteria in the case studies for this lab alone. Do not use a key. This is a key for this lab alone. Do not use a previous key. Do not use this key when identifying your unknown species because this key will not work. It's only looking at uh, two families, Enterobacteriaceae and the Pseudomonaceae. Okay. But use this key to uh, determine the test. Like if you get the oxidase resist, all the Enterobacteriaceae are negative for that test. 
and the Pseudomonaceae are all positive. We're only looking really at Pseudomonaceae, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. You can write the information for the case studies here. So if case study was oxidase positive, you put it plus there or check mark. If oxidase negative, you can put a negative or leave it blank. And then for all the other tests, fill in the information here. And then identify what case study unknown number one was. Put it in here. You do need to mention a species. You will not get full credit unless you mention a species. Okay. I suppose for the Pseudomonaceae, all you need to do is state Pseudomonas because we're only looking at Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Okay. But all the others, you must give the species because each of the uh, members of the anterior bacteriaceae is a different species and it has different results in the different tests. So identify the different species in the case study here and then submit the worksheet only. Do not submit the lab module. Any questions about what you're doing? All right, I'll be here until eight o'clock to answer questions. I would say get started on the lab. Oh, let me go through the uh, case studies, at least the first one. Uh, below are the results of uh, case study one. A prison inmate is brought into the ER room with open wound, and this prisoner is known for self-inflicting, meaning he gives himself wounds. A routine culture and sensitivity test is ordered. The appropriate transport media is used for specimen collection or inoculation. And then the media uh, is grown, the, the bacteria are grown on the prescribed media. Uh, here are the results. This is a blood auger test. And you can see the uh, hemolysis of the blood in this picture. And then the uh, routine test. The bacteria were then isolated from colony, grown on a MAC plate. And you can see the results to the MAC plate here. And it tells you some information. And then we have the gram stain. You can blow that up if you need to. Let me blow that up here. You should be able to determine what the shape of the bacteria is, as well as the gram stain. The gram stain, I can tell blowing it up to try and determine the shape. All right, now I see the shape there from these two in particular. You have to blow it up quite a bit because uh, actually all of this lab is on the gram-negative ba bacteria, but uh, um, the... Uh, the bacilli in this lab are awfully short, and so you have to blow it up to be certain of the shape. Let me shrink that down a little more. All right, the rapid tests were run. They did the catalase test. It was catalase positive. It was oxidase negative. And then they uh, isolated colonies and set up tests and this page got split, but that is the SIMS test here. That is the MR test. This is the VP test. This is the Simon citrate test. And this is the TSI test. And so you can read the results here. I will tell you that this one is not a multi-organism. You don't see the growth flaring out. Actually, I don't see the stab mark either, but it's not multile. And uh, then you can tell from the indole from this, whether it's indole positive or not. Anyways, read the results here, record them in the worksheet, and then identify the species using the key given in the worksheet. And this is the key here.
only use this key for this lab for these case studies. All right, any questions? All right, if not, I will be here to answer questions until eight o'clock. So if you have I a question for the for the lab in the in the table where the species are not mentioned, just the genus. Is only the genus expected to be written or you're talking about the pseudomonaceae? Uh yeah, well, not just that. Oh, you're the, talking about salmonella? Yeah. Um, yeah, you don't need to identify the species because the exact species is not given here. Um, okay. I think all the salmonella give salmonellaosis, but there is more than one species. But yeah, in this case, you only need to get the genus. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I don't know if Shigala even has different uh, species, but salmonella does. Oh, there's one too. That's odd. All right. That one, you only need the genus also. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good question. Mm -hmm. All right. There's been a question about case study five from the last lab. And I decided to go ahead and go through it and record it in case anyone else has a question. So in case study five, all right uh case study five a 38 year old female and she's an addict she has a low-grade fever malaise signs of mitral cardiac valve anomaly her condition progressively worsens she's admitted to the hospital her attending physician orders three blood cultures the next morning one blood culture broth is cloudy and you can see blood in uh, bacteria in her blood that actually looks like streptococci. Uh, the broth is gram stain and subcultured on blood auger plates. And there, oh, there it is there. So uh, this is uh, um, alpha hemolysis because there's darkening of the blood auger and it isn't darkening everywhere so i understand your confusion let me blow this up a little oh, there it is there uh like these colonies they don't have much darkening but that one actually does have a little bit around it a very thin darkening of the media and this doesn't look greenish at all, but there is definitely black in this region, and that's darkening of the media. So this is alpha hemolysis of the blood auger. Let me shrink this down now. I can. That's good. And uh, in the SF broth test, that's SF broth negative. In the bile esculin test, that's... Uh, Esculin negative. In the uh, catalase test, that's catalase negative. And what bacteria was isolated? Um, oh, there's also uh, a test here. Um, what does P stand for? Does anyone remember? Uh, let me go to the worksheet. And actually, let me go to the dichotomous key. So it's a cocci, it's catalase negative, and then it's alpha hemolysis. So that means it's not gamma, because this is a gamma hemolysis. Okay. So it's either streptococcus pneumonia or varinian streptococcus, and it's a Optogen positive or optogen negative. And let me go back. Oops. And that was what was here. And you notice the bacteria, you can blow this up to see it better. The bacteria are growing right up to the disc. 
So this is optogen negative. Okay. Yeah, that greenish kind of like that's what told me. Okay, it must be the Freudian. Uh, you're talking about this. That's not really greenish in this one. It's dark. Yeah. I suppose, yeah, that's not gamma at yeah, all, actually. Gamma yeah, hemolysis. that makes yeah. sense. That's alpha hemolysis. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Fred was, uh, it was about. Um, it wasn't about this. It was a different. It was about the unknown project. All right. Um, is it something general or is it something yes. specific? Pretty okay. general. Well, yeah. Pretty. Okay. Pretty general. It was for if we have a test. Right. The third test that you did was the the fermentation of. Um, lactose. What, what was it? PR lactose. Thank you. Lact yeah, lactose fermentation test. That test, however, was uh, not, if the test is not conducive to one's, um, well, the finding out what the unknown is, can we omit the test from the, I mean, I still put it in the notes, but from the final report, can we omit it? As, uh, you should we, mention that you did the test, but on your table, okay. you're not using that test to identify your unknown. So it doesn't okay. need to be in the table. So I made it from the dichotomous key, right? The dichotomous logic? Yeah, I omit it from your dichotomous key. Okay, that's all right. Okay. I think that's... I think yeah, that's, some people it's helpful and other people it's not. It, it just depends on what your unknown was. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Anything else? There was a... Uh, well, for the... I mean, I don't know. Your... I mean, obviously... Maybe some tips for the for the test that's coming up. I've been studying the chapter five and six. Oh, for the but, quiz? Yeah. Yes. Uh, maybe some uh any something I should focus on. Well, you should focus on uh lab seven and chapter five and six. Right. Over but anything in particular. Chapter six. Well, yeah, if you really want to know, go over the uh Objectives for chapter five and six. I've got them on my web page. Uh -huh. Go there. And just make sure you can answer all of the objectives because all the questions will come from the objectives. The objectives. Uh, you have to fill in the answers for the objectives. I don't give you that, but uh, oh, there's six. So let's just go there. Can you guys see my screen? I don't know if I've got it on or not. Yeah, I see the screen. Okay, great. So go over the objectives and and answer each objective because all of the questions will come from an objective. Okay. okay? Mm -hmm. Is that a good tip? Yeah. There's gonna. I was wondering, just wondering about the specific, like how much ATP is produced, where. Um, like I mean, I kind of I mean, I kind of memorized it. I memorized it all, but just wondering if that's going to be is like that, that in chapter five. I don't remember. Let that's me. chapter five metabolism. Yeah, microbial. You should know where ATP is produced in the aerobic respiration. You should know at what steps, like two in glycolysis, two in the Krebs cycle, and for prokaryotes, you have. Uh, 34 being produced in the electron transport chain. For eukaryotes, you have 32 to 34, depending on what cell you're talking about. Um, so you mm -hmm. should know that. You should know the end products of uh, uh, each step, meaning the end product. You start with glucose and glycolysis. You end up with uh, mm -hmm. pyruvate and mm -hmm. uh, 2 ATP and 2 NADH. Mm -hmm. And the pyruvate goes into the preparatory step, which is converted into uh, to acetyl coenzyme A, which is put into the Krebs cycle. And then the end product is CO2. The starting for the preparatory step is pyruvic acid. Um, you do generate 2 ATP and you generate 
a number of NADH and two FAD, F, FADH2. Is my getting that acronym right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it's uh, six. Six NADH. NADH and then, but two then two NADH, NADH in a preparatory step, right? And two in the glycolysis. Uh huh. Okay. And then the NADH and the FADH2 carry the electrons to the electron transport chain. Mm -hmm. But sometimes the Krebs cycle ATP is referred to as GTP. That um, doesn't matter. No, mm -hmm. no. Actually, first GTP, I didn't go over that. First GTP is made in the Krebs mm -hmm. cycle. You guys, you don't need to know this, but he's asking the question. But then the GTP is used to make ATP. So GTP oh. is always made, but then it's converted mm -hmm. into ATP. So I just simplified it and said ATP is made. Oh, okay. So you just need to know that two ATP are made. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I didn't okay. even discuss the other, that GTP is made and it's converted into ATP. All right. Thank you. Okay. All right. Mm-hmm.